and we were playing uh, a <clears throat> chitlin circuit. Red Rooster, Bloody Bucket, you know, them kind of joints. That chicken wire around the bandstand. Those clubs is his stomping ground, you know? He said, I'll tell you one thing, I told him, I'm the killer, I'll make it back to the top. Jerry and I used to go downtown to the Malco Theater and watch a lot of horror movies. So we watched uh, Lon Chaney and the Weirwolf. We got ready to leave and went out back and got in that Rolls Royce out there and we were pulling up to the main street. Well, this cat come walking down the sidewalk and he was dressed in full makeup and full showbiz as Liberace is who it was. And Libby always dressed, you know, to the hilt. Jerry looked at me and he said, you know what I ought to do? I said, what's that, killer? He said, I ought to run over that motherfucker. There'd be one less piano player to worry about. I said, well, go ahead. Go ahead and run over him. He revved the motor up, put the car in gear. He said, no, I reckon I'll let him live right now this time. The killer could be impulsive. He liked to have a good time, remembers Rusty Brown, Myra's brother, also a drummer for Jerry Lee. Well, after a show, he expected everybody to come to his room. And, like, you'd either party there or you'd go out to a club somewhere. That was every night. Then he rented him a, a little office in Memphis so he could have a place to go to until the clubs opened back up that evening. The cocaine use and the pills and the drinking, the light killed him. Amphetamines, uh, bifetamines, what you call black widows. The same thing everybody, Johnny Cash and Carl Ferg, everybody was taking. We got to the point where the colors were the thing. I'll give you two black ones for one of the red and white ones. That's the way that was. I mean, we, we never knew, you know, at a point in time what we were taking, how much we were taking. He'd been up wired to the max for two or three days, shooting up the joint. Throwing knives, raising hell, you know. So after, like, the third night, people were falling asleep on sofas and stuff. And they were saying, Jerry, we're just so tired, we can't stay awake. He had bought a machine gun that belonged to Machine Gun Kelly. He got it from a collector or something, man. He was proud of that old machine gun. So he picked up that machine gun and just sprayed the ceiling with all these bullets. <laughs> so everybody kind of woke up then. Next day, boy, I mean, they, they're, they're having a fit. He shot up a demo lab that was next door to him, shot up $50,000 worth of false teeth. <laughs> that was the end of his little office right there. Over time, Jerry was able to climb over the chicken wire and make his way back to the top, in part by playing gigs on the bill with some of his best friends and biggest rivals, like Chuck Berry. There were two really good showmen. Chuck Berry was a good showman, too. But Chuck Berry had a big ego. Jerry had ego. And the promoter worked it out to where one would close the show the next night, the other one would close the show. Well, Jerry obviously didn't want Chuck Berry to be able to follow Jerry Lee Lewis. So they argued back and forth, and uh, Jerry goes, okay, killer, you know, you can close the show. So Jerry, he goes out there and, and does, of course, a great show. It was right after he did Great Balls of Fire, he pulled a can of lighter fluid out of his pocket and squirted it inside the piano and threw a match in there and caught the damn piano on fire. He walks off stage and says, Follow that motherfucker. <laughs> you know. It's hard to follow a burning piano. Mm -hmm. 